welcome to Live in the Hive, the only online magazine show dedicated to theatre across Greater Manchester. I'm Michelle Eagleton. I am with you for the next 30 minutes. If you like your theatre, then you're definitely in the right place. We have news, we've got interviews and much much more now big hello if you're watching on the i love manchester facebook platform that's the iconic city brand dedicated to community and culture or you might be watching on our very own live in the hive facebook page we are here every sunday at eight o'clock all we need is you to be watching and what is in store for you tonight you might be asking well we have got these guys we have got a fantastic playwright now she's called harriet madeley and she's been working really hard on a great production which is coming to the stage very very soon it's having its premiere at the lowry in salford it's called edith and it is based on a real life story it is gripping she's going to be telling us about it very very soon and if that wasn't enough we're talking to one of the performers of head over heels the musical brilliant musical it's been in broadway it's now having its european premiere at hope mill theater which is in ancos and is hesketh is going to be joining us to tell us all about it and what we can expect and you know what if that wasn't enough well every week we do bring you the latest greater manchester theater news and we've got some brilliant announcements to share with you a little bit later on in the show so don't go anywhere it's a fantastic night tonight we've got a great show lined up for you and we're going to kick it off with a wonderful writer. She's called Harriet Maidley. I got to catch up with her earlier this week to find out about this really exciting play that she has wrote called Edith. Now, I did mention just then it is based on a real life story of a woman who was hanged for the murder of her husband a hundred years ago. In fact, last week, it was the anniversary of her conviction. So I wanted to find out a little bit more about this production and what it's going to be like when it's brought to the stage. So here's what Harriet had to say. It's sort of been buried as a story because you could almost look at it and think it's just too awful. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I'm interested in stories like that. I'm interested in stories that people are too scared to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, well, it certainly starts conversations, and I think this will, because we're talking about a lady who 100 years ago was hanged for the murder of her husband, and there wasn't a lot of evidence to convict her, and she didn't actually do it. I mean, you know this more than I do, but that's the premise, isn't it, Harriet? It is, yeah. Um, her husband was stabbed by her young lover. So she was having an affair with uh, a man called Bre Freddie Bywaters, who was eight and a half years her junior. He was 20 and she was 28. And he's the one that killed her husband. But the narrative went that, oh, it must have been her that persuaded him to do it. Even though, as you say, there was very, very little evidence. The only evidence that they used against her was her love letters to him. Right. I mean, it was so different back then. We're talking like a century ago. And I imagine for a woman to take on a toy boy, <laughs> cheat on her husband. I mean, her name must have been Mud from the start, right? Absolutely. And I think there was a bit of a kind of moral panic at the time about, um, you know, women were sort of nudging progress in all of these areas. Women had only just been allowed onto the jury, were kind of at the start of the 1920s. So almost if Edith had been around, like had been born a few years later, if this had happened a few years later, she would have done better. But at the time, there was a real sort of pushback against the idea that sort of women were um, betraying the, the values that had held society up for so long and they had to be sort of put in their place. Wow. Um, so she scared a lot of people, I think. Oh, I imagine so. But like you said, I hadn't heard of it. You didn't hear about it until this. How does it get from almost being buried to now becoming this stage production? Well, yeah, so I, I found out about it a couple of years ago. Um, I think I was just, I was looking into the death penalty in England and, and particularly women that had been hanged because it was, it was very unusual um, from the start of the 20th century to hang women, there were hardly any. Um, and yeah, I found this story and started working on it from there. And basically what I found that really excited me was the, the, the all of the real transcripts of the trial are available online. That's really the sort of, the base of the play is 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 made from these these real uh, transcripts, um, and then I knew that it was a hundred years coming up. So I sort of 
assumed and hoped that there would be more interest on this story. And there definitely is. Um, there's actually a, a campaign underway that's being led by Edith's family to, to pardon her which it looks like the government might be U-turning on. So it, there's a very real possibility that 100 years later she'll she'll get a pardon. Well, it certainly is going to kind of divide people because at the time yeah. there was <laughs> this division about, you know, was it right or was it wrong? And let's mm -hmm. take a look at what some people think about it in today's world. Edith Thompson wore a fur coat. A slim thing. Looking incapable of that which she stands accused. The women in particular have turned against her with amazing rapidity. Once in the witness box, I could see her better. Very slim. She's not a skilled writer. A fantasist. She's difficult to understand. Both as a woman and a human being. The vision of national decay. Edith Thompson is a shocking little piece of rubbish. She's not a skilled writer. She's not a skilled writer. Oh, this really is going to get people talking. I know it is, Harriet. Now, yeah. how do we see this come across on stage as well? Because, you know, you're talking about transcripts. Is this like a bit of a docudrama we're going to get? Yeah, it is in a way. I mean, the trial was five days long. So don't worry, we're not going to put people through a five day play. <laughs> but, um, so the transcripts have been heavily cut and heavily edited. And they're basically stitched together with dramatized scenes. I mean, that something that the judge said during the trial to the jury was um, you have to remember that you are in a court of law judging a vulgar and common crime. You are not sitting in the stalls of a theater watching a play. So that's like a gift, right? For something like yeah, this. Oh, of course it is. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's not a documentary. It is a play. We have played around with the sources. But I mean, there's something very interesting, I think, about the interplay between um, the court and the theatre. Like people are telling stories in a court. They're trying to sell their story about who they think this woman is. And neither story is entirely true, probably. And um, so it's it's yeah, it's a really rich place to um, investigate for theatre, I think. And if you think about it, back in the day, the court probably was like a theatre because lots of people would crowd in there to kind of hear what was going on and and like queue up to get in and there was something really yeah. interesting that I found on uh, on your social media actually comparing yeah, the kind of the queues and still today you know the yeah. Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial where people are sitting outside of the court kind of wanting the first hand of what's going on. Exactly. I mean, I, I think that, you know, in all sorts of ways, lots has changed, but in other ways, it really hasn't. I think especially when a woman is on trial um, for a gruesome crime, people are obsessed. Like people love a murder case and they love, particularly with a woman, to take apart who they think she is. And it's much more, much, much, much more common for women to get vilified in that context than men, I think. Um, so, I mean, I, I felt like it was important to make it because I felt like there's lots going on in it that's very, very relevant to what still happens today. And again, you know, you, you got that relevance, I suppose, from talking to the women at Style Prison, which is actually just down the road from where we are here in Manchester. Yeah, How right. did they react to this? <laughs> um, it was an amazing day. So we we read through the play with them and the women played the, the lawyers. And then there's little breaks in the play, basically, and at the end of every day where the audience are essentially just like encouraged to discuss what they think of Edith. And that started in those workshops with the women. And what they said was so interesting that I thought we've got to kind of, yeah, encourage everyone who sees the play to sort of take take this line of inquiry. They were overwhelmingly sympathetic towards Edith, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And they felt that she was um, set up, that she was portrayed in a, in a really unfair light. Um, and I think a big kind of element for them was the media scrutiny around the whole thing like lots of these women have all of these women have been through trials and lots of them have had um a lot of hate uh in the media and from the public um and so there's this, this question in the play around uh <laughs> to what extent trials can be completely fair when these cases are in the press and there, there was no way that the jury going in would have been entirely oblivious to that press coverage um because reporters were crowding in and as you say like it was it was impossible to avoid the, the sort of glare uh, of the attention um so yeah they were really they were a really really useful voice in helping to shape it um, I can imagine uh, kind of bringing that sense of realism and maybe giving you a little bit of 
food for thought about kind of how you go about presenting it. I know you've got a director yeah. who's on board here. Yeah. Is it a small cast then? Have we just got kind of an ED? Have we got a Frederick? Have we got kind of like, you know? It's, it's a cast of five and we've right. got we've got an Edith, we've got a Freddie, and we've got a Percy, who is her husband who died. Mm -hmm. And the actor that plays Percy also plays the judge. And then oh. you've got a prosecution and you've got a defence. So that's the setup. And then, but there's lots of kind of smaller characters who come in and do kind of witness statements and stuff like that. So all actors apart from Edith are kind of multi-rolling. And Edith is sort of at the centre of this kind of... And then the interaction too, then, like you say, that the break's in. So do they come into the audience? Because I think... That's amazing that it almost feels like you're you're breaking down that fourth wall and you're yeah. kind of inviting people in to which will make the production I imagine quite different every time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean the the main purpose of our work at Crowded Room is to generate conversation and that audiences are a huge like a vital part of that. Um so yeah, it makes the whole thing quite dynamic. So what's going to happen is uh, Edith is going to leave and the other actors are going to sit like at the side of the stage, but with ear defenders on. So kind of the audience are going to feel like they're on their own. So they can speak freely, say what they think of her, um, say which side they're on. You know, it's a play, it's a story. So it's been structured in such a way as to kind of manipulate you in one direction or another. Um, so it'll be interesting to see which way people's sympathies lie. Edith is a fascinating character because she is very complicated. She is very layered. She did say a lot of things that, if she was on trial today, many, many people would find her very unlikable. Mm -hmm. um, there's something challenging about that that I think it's, um, it's interesting to put in front of an audience today. Oh, that does sound a fantastic play and all the more better that it is a real life story. I definitely think it's going to get people talking, especially if you go to see that production. Will you think that Edith was wronged or was she right to be hanged for the murder? of her husband if you do want to catch it it is at the lowry for a few performances in february do check out the lowry website if you want to get tickets still to come though on the show we're going to be talking to is hesketh they're going to be telling me a little bit about head over heels the musical it sounds brilliant hilarious bold and as i say it has been on Broadway and now we get it in great anchors at Hope Mill Theatre. Do you know what? They bring some great productions to us. They really, really do. But first off, let's take a look at what is going on in Greater Manchester. And this week, what has been announced, it's time for Greater Manchester Theatre News. And yes, it is back with a bang. Mamma Mia, what a favourite musical it has been over the years. It actually opened, I believe, in the West End about 1999. That's going to be 24 years of this year. Oh, my goodness. Now, it's coming to the Opera House from the end of this month until the 11th of February. A really nice run it's got at the Opera House. And of course, it is abertastic. You've got all the brilliant ABBA classics rolled into this musical, which is set in Greece. It's fun. It's camp. It's fabulous. It will have you dancing on your feet from start to finish. Don't forget to catch that if you can, especially if you want to get rid of those January blues. Guaranteed to do that is Mamma Mia. And this is a brilliant news story that I came across this week. And it's the fact that the National Theatre is going to be touring a production around nine state secondary schools in Greater Manchester. Now they're going to go to Wigan, Salford, Rochdale, just to name a few. And it's a new production called Shut Up, I Am Dreaming, created by a physical ensemble theatre company called The Pappy Show. Now, what they've done is they've created this production with secondary school students, which is great. And it is going to visit a different school every day for 11 weeks. It's going to go not just to Greater Manchester, it's going to go across England as part of the National Theatre's largest ever schools tour. And what you're going to find is it's going to be really diverse, this production, and it's going to reflect the lived experience of their performers. It's going to be movement and dance, moments of joy and sharing stories. And what is really, really exciting as well is the set that it's going to have. 
as you can see there on the right hand side, it's going to be transformed with a gigantic movable climbing frame set, which is going to go a lot into the sports halls of these schools. This is a great project. It's really going to grow and sustain new audiences for live theatre and hopefully create opportunities to engage in the arts for young people. A couple of the schools to give a bit of a shout out across Greater Manchester include Outwood Academy in Hindley in Wigan. You've got Edgar Wood Academy in Haywood. You've got Pendleton College in Salford and Hollingworth Academy in Rochdale. And that has been happening this week and it's going to be continuing next week as well. And can you believe it is the 50th anniversary this year of the Rocky Horror Show? Yes, it was actually launched back in 1973 by the wonderful Richard O'Brien. And it's become such a cult classic. I have seen these loads on stage and I still love it. Loads of people dress up, they shout at the performers and it's just a raucous night out. Definitely, they will be time warping to this as it goes on tour to celebrate those 50 years. It's going to be coming to Manchester's Opera House on the 20th of February and runs there until the 25th. You definitely have to go and have a bit of a time walk with them yourself. Do you know what? I'm going to have to get myself down there as well. I'll be dressing up as Jana. I'll get my husband dressed up as Brad Major. So if you see us, do give us a wave. Now, talking of cult classics, there is one that's on its way to Hope Mill Theatre very, very soon. Now, it starts its previews on the 26th of January, just around the corner, and this is running till March. Now, it's called Head Over Heels. It did brilliantly on Broadway. It's the first time this has come to Europe, and it is here at Hope Mill Theatre, which is so exciting. A great venue, dead intimate, and really does invest in such fresh productions like this one. Now, if you want something that's bold, something that's hilarious, something that's camp, then you can go no wrong with this one. And I found out a lot more about it by interviewing one of its stars, it's Hesker. It's so much fun. It's been incredible. It's been like all systems go. We've literally only had like, it's the end of like our third week. Um, I know, so it's been like literally like all guns blazing, but it's been so much fun. Um, it's also really cool because the show is, it has so many different um, time periods in it, not in the story, but like it's based on an old Greek tragedy, I believe. And then it's written in like Shakespearean language using 80s music set in, the in like 2023. So it's like, there's just so much to it that's like so exciting and fresh. It's, it's great. But it's, it's, a, it's a proper mix, isn't it? Yeah. On Broadway, I believe, hasn't it? And yes, it, uh, yeah, a few European, years ago. European premiere that we're getting. Yes, it is it's the European home. premiere. Yeah. Hope Mill, baby. Yeah. It's like kind of my second home as well, because I did Rent, obviously, twice at the Hope Mill. Brilliant. Yeah, and so, it was amazing. Oh, and I've got to say, I was there the night when it had to close the next day because of oh, the no. because COVID. Yeah, yeah. In. And then to see kind of everybody really welling up, thinking, you yeah. know what, we've worked so hard for this, and then mm -hmm. not to go ahead. But theatre is going big style. She's live and kicking. Live, live and kicking. And <laughs> this is a great stage to have it on. I, uh, I I know that Will and Joe just oh, make the best choices when it comes to bringing productions to the stage. Always. It's brilliant. They're so smart. They're so innovative. They're so caring. I literally, they'll probably kill me for saying this because they're not old enough to be, but they're literally like my dad's. Like, they just honestly, like, the support they show. Like, I feel like once you've worked in a the theatre, they're like, you're like family to them. Yeah. And just the support that they give you once you've like done bits is just so nice and it's so it's so it feels really like touching it's really sweet i mean you can see the passion in them yeah completely, but they will kill you for saying that i know i feel it my dad <laughs> now let's get back to the premise of you know head over heels because yeah. when i first heard the story the first thing from me yeah, wasn't you. maybe the yeah. greek thing yeah, it was the very much shakespearean yeah it has a feel of like a bit of a midsummer night stream to it Do you it is very is very similar and i think my um 
the way I'm kind of playing my character is very like kind of like Hook from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. It's very similar. We're playing then very much like a like kind of like ethereal, like pixie nymph kind of being, which has been really cool, which I think is slightly different to how it was played on Broadway, which is exciting. Um but it's very like that. Like it's it's and there's like a journey and they set up camp and there's like it's very camp, saying the word camp, it's very okay. camp. Love it. Um but yeah, it's very midsummer night streamy. And I I speak in a dialect called Eclog, which is like I think it's like a old Greek way of speaking, I think, but obviously it's like translated into English. So one of my lines is a slant by avian orbits, Diane's moon shoots her silvered fair balloons. And it's all very like poetic and like it's gorgeous. Wow. And what, what is that like as you know, a performer to kind of go from that to then the lyrics of the yeah. Girl yeah. Girl. It actually is kind of almost so I don't feel so normally that I think the rule with musical theatre is that um musicals only work if it's seen into song smoothly yeah funnily enough with this a lot of the songs are dialogue 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 and a song like it like comes out of nowhere and smacks you in the face half the time and it's kind of like works a lot better than if it was seen into songs smoothly and i feel like also that works as well because you're going from like speaking with like doth hath becometh my one is true with loveth and then you're going into stop before you know it you know what i mean like it's like bops immediately it's so much fun and it's also really cool to find the bridge in two mm -hmm. things that really shouldn't go together but do yeah and go I together really that. well but i didn't realize that the go-go's did so many like amazing songs historical heaven is a place on earth belinda carlisle who knew amen and I start the song, darling, I'm fussing. Ooh, baby, do you know what that's worth? It's so much fun. That is a moment. That has got to be a moment. Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> what is your character like then? Because I know from knowing the production itself, mm -hmm. you are involved in one of the romantic stories. Because there's kind of, there's one, two, three going on, possibly four. What does yeah. Mean? yeah, 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 I get you. I get you. The fourth that think but then don't. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then me somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a bit then about Pythio for people who, you know, are coming to see it. Give them a little bit of a lowdown. Mm -hmm. I won't delve too much into it, only because I think if I do, I will ruin the end bit of the story. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I will say from the get go, well, they are a fierce. Nymph, god, goddess-like creature with the ability to predict the future and they're, they're, they hold the Oracle of Delphi. Um, they are very, in our version anyway, it's a lot less draggy and like sassy. It's a lot more like quirky and like a little bit weird and like, yeah, so it's, I'm playing it very different to how my sister Peppermint played it and she was like really like fierce and draggy and I'm a lot more like weird and like you never quite know what I'm going to do. And that, <laughs> that was kind of you know proper standout that made such a splash didn't it over yeah. the world way that Peppermint mm -hmm. did. How she was the first she was the tra first trans woman to originate a role on Broadway. Yes but come on it's Flipping it, Margot, you are <laughs> fully blonde. Thank Come you. On. Thank you. Yeah. Correct, it's true. <laughs> it's true. I mean, there's room for all of us, eh? We're all doing making bits of history and yeah, it's crazy. And to be to be honest, that's what I think we need to see more of, more representation right. in this. And, and that's this why show I'm... has it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, this takes so much. It what does. is the plan next? How else are you going to conquer the world is? <laughs> um, I actually, um, I have, I just did an ITV show that comes out at the end of the month. It's called Buffering by Ian Sterling. Yeah, it's really cool. It's an ITV comedy series. I'm a new series regular on that. And then I am going to be in a Disney Plus series. 
Like, I know only three of This is before. so exciting. <laughs> I know. And we got you here on Live in the Hive first. Yeah, hey, Live in the Hive, yes. <laughs> I shut up now, don't worry. Ian like Sterling, though. Are we talking the yeah. same Ian Sterling that does the voiceover for Love yeah, Island? Yeah, for Love Island. Yeah. Wow, that is funny. Did you have him saying all the um, all the stuff that he says, uh, you know, all right on the paper? I would have you had to have. I actually don't watch it. <laughs> I don't watch the violence. And I felt so bad because he was like speaking about it and I was like, I've never, I've never watched it. I'm sorry. He was like, you know what, fair enough, neither have I. I was like, <laughs> probably funny. a good thing but is probably. A good I thing. probably. <laughs> oh, I'll definitely be watching out for is hitting our screens. And of course, if you want to see them in the flesh, they will be at Hope Mill Theatre from the 26th of January in Head Over Heels. It sounds absolutely fantastic. And don't forget, if you do want to catch a show in Greater Manchester, well, you can find out all the details of where to go and what to see by heading to the I Love Manchester website. They've got all the information that you need on there. And do give us a check out on our social media. We are on Twitter and Instagram at Live in the Hive 21. And of course, we are here every Sunday night at eight o'clock on the Facebook channels of I Love Manchester and live in the hive so if you love theatre or know anyone who loves theatre do spread the word thank you so much to our guests is and harriet and we'll be back next week for more live in the hive so until then have a fantastic week yourselves and i'll see you next sunday <laughs>